So uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Phil Bourne from the uh, NIH, who is, uh, I think, I don't know your exact title, Associate Director for Data, something like that, at the at NIH. Good enough. Uh, also from uh, uh, University of California, San Diego. Here you go. Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I'm not going to tell you so much about uh, what the NIH is doing, I, I, although I have to give you some background. I'm actually here to engage with this community because essentially everything that I've heard, particularly uh, what Ed was saying, where, where you're trying to head with this, is exactly what the NIH is doing in its own domain. So uh, I just want to give you a little uh, emphasis of that and then move forward. And there's everything that's been said has resonated with me. I'll just hit on a couple of points. So the, the data sharing and the non-enforcement of data sharing plans. Well, there's actually a pretty easy fix to that. First of all, if we made the data sharing plan, at least elements of it, machine readable, uh, and then at the other end of the pipeline, we actually had provenance on the data that's generated that included the grant number, we've closed the gap. We don't even actually have to have a human in, in the process to say what's going on with the data. So that's the first thing. The other point that Margaret made, and I'll try and emphasize throughout my thing, is that I don't think any of this makes any sense without a business model. And I don't actually see necessarily a business model in the way some of the things we're thinking about. So that's just my own sort of particular bias in all this. So let me tell you uh, just where we're at and what we're doing and how we might engage with this group. Um, so about uh, two years ago now, a report was uh, released it was commissioned by uh, Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH. Uh, it was a bioinformatics working group. And it basically uh, essentially says that the uh, NIH has got serious about data. And part of that, of course, comes be because it actually affects the mission uh, of the NIH completely. But also, there's, there's a, a strong force from above. Uh, for example, today, at five o'clock, and I was working on this a bit yesterday with Francis Collins, there is a briefing to the president about big data and genomics. Uh, he's asked for this. And so this, the effect of all of this, of course, is it trickles down. So it trickles down initially to OSTP, and uh, Mike Stevens was going to address that. I was at, actually with Mike and Todd Park at the White House last week. There's, there's a lot of serious uh, effort and thought going into uh, the whole data problem. So I think this is all good news. This is going to trickle down into a whole series of activities and hopefully uh, some funding to at least stimulate uh, getting to points of more persistence and, and better business models. Uh, so so out, of all, out of what uh, this report, one of the things was, uh, you can read these things for yourself, but one of them was to actually hire someone to uh, sort of help with this. Uh, Eric Green uh, started this initially. Uh, as in the interim basis, and then I was hired in March, and I report directly to Francis Collins. I actually sit just above, one floor above him, he bangs on the ceiling when there's a data problem, and I come running. Um, so we're quite serious about what we're going to do with data, and uh, this year there's about, this fiscal year, there's about $45 million in programs that's about to be uh, distributed, and I'll say a little about that in the context of the bigger picture. Next year, that ramps up to uh, over $100 million. So we actually had a retreat yesterday with the team uh, that's working on this to begin to figure out how we can use that money the most effectively. And so uh, I think there's, there's opportunities in doing things going forward. So in the three months that I've been at the NIH uh, now, I've, I've talked to a large number of stakeholders. And I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but there are many different stakeholder groups we heard a lot about uh, various ones already this morning. I would say uh, others in include societies and, and, and so on, which I didn't hear mentioned, but there, and foundations, which I think are also a key part of all of this. So in talking to all of these people in, in lots of different contexts, I'd say some good news has come. Um, there's a recognition at the NIH, which by the way, you're probably, many of you are familiar with it, but it's essentially 27 institutes and centers, 27 different silos effectively doing their own thing, each with an appropriation of funds from Congress directly. Um, and then money goes into trans NIH programs, including the one that I'm leading now. So um, 
breaking that down is, you know, it's obviously a, a very difficult, but there's a recognition that there's a lot of duplicative effort going on, that data is becoming increasingly important to the mission of each of the institutes and centers, let alone the NIH as a whole, so we need to do something about it. Uh, there's certainly inefficiencies, can, uh, efficiencies can be achieved uh, in ways that we're not currently doing. There's lots of replicative efforts uh, beginning to look at that. Uh, the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative is one piece of this, and it's really the beginnings, and I emphasize the beginnings, of a plan to move all of this forward. Um, and I think we have some, uh, you know, some amazing data scientists in our extramural community and also intramural at the NIH that could, who can uh, help address this. And we're reaching out to this community, of course. Uh, lots of ideas for in, uh, interfacing with you uh, in ways that uh, have not traditionally been done. You know, I don't have a lot of time to say anything about all this, but I will be here all day so, uh, and this evening, so I'd love to talk to you more about this. Uh, okay, so let's look at, that's the good news. What about the bad news? Well, the bad news is we, as already been alluded to, we do not have a sustainability plan. On my day one at the NIH, I said to Francis Collins, I, I Googled it, but I couldn't find the NIH data sustainability plan. And he said, well, guess what? You're making one, so we don't have one. So, uh, you know, this is, this is a serious concern. And so when we just heard about the OSTP uh, memo, you know, that essentially describes why we're doing this, but it doesn't say how we're going to do it. And, you know, this is a, you know, a serious issue. Uh, we don't even know how the data we currently have are used. Forget about the big data problem. We, you know, I just came, I've been involved, in fact, Jane mentioned it, in running the Protein Data Bank. We, as just one example, we re don't really know how that data is being used. What we report to the NSF is things like, okay, we have X number of users per month, so many terabytes of data are downloaded uh, across you know, different IP domains. That's, that's the extent of the reporting. But if no one really asks us to look in and say, okay, look at every, all the data objects in that resource, how are they being used and why? Surely that should inform some of the decisions that we make going forward because there's a history here. We don't even really look at that. And we're in the process of thinking about how to do that best. So as a result of that, we can't really estimate future supply and demand. And this is a supply and demand problem, in my view. Um, and, you know, and so we don't really know how to budget for it. I go around and I ask the institute directors at NIH, we've, I've now talked at length to 20 of the 27 of them. Um, I say, well, how much do you think you should be spending on data in years to come? They don't know at this point. You know. So in other words, how much of what happens is going to be based on the data, the quality of the, and the amount of data that we already have versus new data we're generating? I don't, we don't really have good answers to these questions. So we need to begin looking at this. So to do this sort of thing, um, I've kind of um, organized what we're doing around data NIH into five uh, thematic areas. And in this short time, I don't have a lot of uh, time to tell you about them. And I'll just focus on one because I think it relates uh, quite heavily to what you, what you want to do here today. And I want to see how we can do this together. Um, so one of them is the, the sustainability that I keep harping on. Um, our approach to dealing with that is effectively the idea of a commons. And that's the, I, the, the notion I want to sort of talk to you uh, about today particularly, because in essence it seems to me that's exactly what you're producing, or about to start producing. And um, Ed and I have already talked about this a little, and I think there's a lot more discussion to be had. And then clearly, wherever I go, training of data scientists uh, is clearly a, a very uh, you know, a problem that really needs addressing. I would say innovation is coming from, there's another theme, and that's coming from our uh, big data to knowledge initiatives, and I'll, I'll say one a few, few words about that. I also don't think we do a particularly good job at the NIH in how, you can see I'm not a typical program kind of person from, the, from a federal agency. Uh, I, I keep shooting myself in the foot, but I don't think we do a particularly good job at uh, in the, I don't think any of the stakeholders, obviously if you don't get a grant, you're going to be grumpy, but even if you do get a grant and the reviewers and the program officers are not particularly happy about the whole process that we have for reviewing 
uh, data-centric grants. So I think that's something that's also under review, and I don't really have a lot of time to talk to you about that. And then there's collaboration across, uh, um, you know, across the agencies. We actually had a, uh, a nice meeting with NSF and DOE and other folks to talk about sustainability, and this is just the beginning. So these, these are all good developments. All of this sort of leads to the notion that at the end of the day we have you know, something which we call the digital enterprise. And I think, you know, clearly without going into a lot of details, uh, the, the, the goals of this are obvious. It's, it's to increase collaboration, it's to, it's to be more efficient, it's to improve reproducibility. This is a big buzz thing around at the NIH right now, partly because there have been these published studies that indicate, for example, that 70% of all seminal studies in, in uh, cancer cannot be reproduced. Uh, this, is, this has had quite a ripple effect. There's lots of implications of that not, of course, being quite the way it is, but it's all about perception. If a congressman re a woman reads this in the newspaper and realizes they're putting four and a half billion dollars a year into the National Cancer Institute, and we can't reproduce 70% of what's coming out of it, this is a problem. So there's a lot of effort uh, about reproducibility, and of course, having the data uh, is a, a key part of all of that. Uh, integration and availability of these things, and um, I'm not just sure how it, uh, engaged, and Jane mentioned it in the, in the context, or it was mentioned in the context of uh, more about student records, but clearly patient data uh, is a, and the, the, the special issues associated with that, and I won't get into all of that, but that's also on the uh, being looked at. So let me just say quickly something about sustainability and this commons idea. And we're actually doing some pilots. So the, I think the approach uh, we're taking with this is um, partly because I would say, I wouldn't say necessarily catastrophic failures, but certainly large scale projects are, that have not lived up to what was it, uh, hoped. Uh, we're actually taking a very uh, low key, agile, small step approach to what we do here. So. But the idea is to create something which we're calling the commons, and I'm going to uh, sort of give you a sense of what that is in a second. Um, and uh, it's going to involve new funding strategies and business models, and we're going to evaluate what we do carefully. So what, is all, what does it look like? And I'll just say this quickly. So you, there's different, I mean, I think the NIH has been uh, really at the forefront of providing uh, data services to its, its particular constituent community. <laughs> The, the National Center for Biotechnology Information really is an amazing gem. Um, and that's a, a really outward facing part of NIH. And you know, the idea is to begin to help create something that no one owns, it's, the NIH doesn't own it, it's, it's way beyond that, that exists uh, to support the enterprise in the ex, in extramural community. So another way of thinking of it is the idea that it's a research object sandbox. So within that, there are a whole series of research objects, which could be data sets. They could be, it could be software. It could be narrative. Uh, it could be final publications. Anything in the research life cycle. And all the commons implies is that there is a small uh, agreement about what those, those objects represent. So the idea that they have an identifier that is agreed upon, and the idea that uh, there's some level of provenance to be, all of this to be determined, um, that, uh, that represents those objects. And of course, the reason for this is it addresses this how problem. And what are we doing about it? Well, we just, I mean, data comes in all, way, all shapes and forms. We heard a lot about the long tail already. Um, that clearly is a very big part of this. You know, if you, if you suddenly you're required to reproduce, you know, be able to reproduce uh, the, the, your experiments and you're required for that data to be available, then, um, you know, something needs to be done above where we are today, which of course is typically a bunch of you know, CDs or something on a shelf in a laboratory. It's just not doesn't cut it. So that's really the long tail, and it's not perhaps quite that dramatic, but it's, it's, it's not where it should be, that's for sure. And I speak from experience in my own lab. Um, and, um, and then there are, of course, high throughput centers of various types across, uh, in terms of the NIH interests uh, across the biological scales. And then, of course, there's all the nuances associated with patient data. And then there's the end game, which of course is about discovery and knowledge and so on. And then in the middle of this is a set of stakeholders. And those stakeholders are not just uh, NIH awardees. There are other folks in other federal agencies. 
the, the rest of academia, and then the private sector. And each one of these is interested in um, being part of this, at least in the discussions I've been having. So we already are about, if not uh, to award, a set of activities to sort of stimulate this kind of thing. So there is going to be a software index. So uh, for NIH-funded research there will, uh, that generates software, there will be an index developed that essentially allows you to find that. Uh, there will be provenance associated with that so that we can actually, finally perhaps software will be better rewarded than it is today. Um, also the idea that, uh, I don't quite know how this will work out yet, it depends how the developers go at it, but the idea that, uh, I wouldn't say call it quite a Yelp for software, but there is no real good feedback for a lot of scientific software right now to actually say how many times it's used. I mean, if GitHub and SourceForge and these things help, of course, but really commentary on this sort of software, we need to start building that. Likewise with data, there's, and separating these two doesn't necessarily make sense, and uh, we're actually looking to address that right now. But there will also be a data index, which effectively is the same kind of thing, where uh, data sets are registered, um, based on these identifiers and um, additional information can be had from them. Um, there is a, and then at the same time, standards are very important in all of this. So the idea, uh, there is a standards initiative as well. Uh, so the idea of actually collecting existing standards, fostering the development of further standards around different data types, and then of course sustaining those standards in some way in our, in, in, for what's relevant to the NIH, that would probably occur through the National Library of Medicine, uh, which of course does a lot of this already. So all of that is embraced in this idea of a commons. And the idea of the commons is, is really, it's undoubtedly likely to be at least in part in the cloud, but it's not, it's not con constrained to the cloud. It could be institutional repositories, it could be other HPC facilities. Um, it's really the, the, the rules that govern uh, the components that actually speak to this. We've begun to work, and of course there has to be a business model, and we've begun to work on uh, beginnings of a business model which will be presented uh, to the NIH leadership in the not too distant future, which uh, looks at one way of potentially doing this. And you know, without getting into a lot of detail, it's really the idea that there is, a certain, there is credits, and those credits enable someone with a research grant to work in the commons. Where they actually spend those credits will be uh, wherever they, they choose to, where the organizations that are maintaining this, this, these research objects in the commons uh, agree to take those credits. And there'll be, uh, the, the, there could be uh, an agent, a third party agent that deals with this. We can get into details of this offline. So what does this look like um, in, in terms of an investigator sitting there at, at, a, term, at a, a, a screen? Well, first of all, the simplest incarnation, it's sort of a Dropbox-like storage, um, uh, but the opportunity to go a little beyond that. So, whoops, sorry. So the idea that uh, as you drag and drop something, that if that file type can be identified, then you can actually look at that file type against a particular standard if it exists for that particular class of data. You can generate a set of metadata that describes compliance to that standard and it can sit there with that file. And you can, you know, you have an access control to that file uh, which defines who can look at, look at it. Um, and in that way you can comply to the data sharing needs. Uh, of course, it, in many cases, with the size of the data, the computer's got to be with the data. Uh, there's the potential for a place to collaborate. So we're going to begin to experiment with this, but one dream, if you like, about this idea is that if you have data sets from different, different uh, environments, then, and say, for example, that relate to different diseases, um, that data probably has relevance across those diseases. But the, the investigators will never, the individual data investigators working with those two data sets may not discover this until after publication or, or way down the research cycle line. But the idea that this, these data are indexed and, and commonalities in those data sets, even though they're from different investigators collected for somewhat different purposes, this kind of analysis might actually enable us to accelerate 
uh, at least from the NIH perspective, what we do with respect to disease. So um, I'm running out of time, so let me not say anything about this. Um, training uh, is a big part of this, um, but um, I really wanted to get the, the notion of the commons across because that is something that um, we're, we're, we're working, you know, I think is perhaps most relevant to this audience. So just to finish, uh, this is sort of, uh, we will be putting these commons pilots in place by the end of the summer. Uh, there's a, a set of awards going out, and what the kind of awards we do next year um, is yet to be determined. But really, awards are going to be there to foster best practices, foster important developments in data science across the spectrum. Um, and I think there's a, a number of distinct opportunities there, including for people in this audience who don't necessarily work in the health, uh, in the health domain, but are clearly doing things that would be very relevant to uh, data in healthcare. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So we're, um, we are a bit over, but on the other hand, we can make up some time at lunch. So I think we ought to, uh, if people have questions, we ought to um, take them now, uh, at least a couple of them. Thanks, Phil. That was great. Um, Mark Parsons, Research Data Alliance. Um, I'm really intrigued by this notion of the commons. And I think it's really, the concept is the right way to go. And um, I've done some work in that in the, in the polar region. And we were building off the concept that Antarctica is a physical commons. And so working on that in a data sense. And I like the idea that if we look at data as a public good, then it needs public and common support. So, but I didn't really get this credits idea. So, so could you expand a little bit on, on how that works? Well, I mean, yeah, sure. That's, and first, I think that's a, an absolutely critical part of this. And, you know, there are various movements in various communities about, uh, for example, data citation and the idea that, uh, you know, that, that, that happens. And I think the first thing we have to do is we have to be able to identify <laughs> data. We have to be able to identify uh, who's associated with producing that data or, in fact, down the line, modifying that data, and then how many people actually you know, look at it. I mean, I'm, I'm really compelled by this from my own experience, and I, I always say this, and I'm saying it, so I only give one talk now many times, so I, I've said this many times, but I have a paper in the biomedical sciences that has 17,000 citations. It's one of the most cited papers in, in all of the biomedical sciences, but no one has ever read it. No one. Because all it is is a data set that references, a, a publication that references the protein data bank. Right? So it's, we're actually using a paper to reference data. This doesn't make any sense, right? in, a, in a logical way at least. So I think we're slowly identifying with that. And there's talk, and I, I, it will happen, I think, at the NIH. The bibliographic sketch at the NIH has just been changed to move away from the, the real emphasis on, on public, you know, high quality publication to more of what you've done as a scholar as a whole. So more of the innovation aspects. The next step of that, of course, is to identify the value of data in this enterprise. You know, what's more valuable, a paper that you write that only you ever cite, or a data set that you've produced that's downloaded and produces 100 <coughs> publications by 100 investigators? It's obvious. We need to, we need to take that into account. And I think identifying data in this way is the first step to be able to do that. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Hi, I'm Lane Johnson from DuraSpace, and I'm very intrigued by the, the Commons approach, too. I was wondering if you'd be able to speak to the work that's, be, that's been done during the past several years with the Clinical and Translational Science Awards Consortium um, you know, 61 institutions gathering tons of data, lots of collaboration tools, et cetera. Um, does that play into this at all? Yeah, I mean, I've talked to Chris Austin, who's the head of NCAT, the director of NCATS at the National Institute of Health, who's responsible for funding those. Yes, I mean, they, they, they see this as you know, a potential way forward. Um, you know, I think it's very easy to get excited about this because conceptually it's, it seems to be the right thing. It's very simple. I think we have to proceed with caution and actually do some, some testing. And you know, the CTSAs have uh, actually brought a lot of aggregated data together. So I think they represent good places uh, 
in the, particularly in the extramural community, to do some pilots around this. So yeah, we've been having that discussion. Dane Morgan from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a material scientist, and we as a community in the Materials Genome Initiative and things have been looking a lot to the biological community for uh, inspiration on how to do things with data. Is, is there a practical path, potentially, if aspects of the infrastructure you're building might be translated into a totally different domain, like materials, to be able to borrow and share some of those tools? I mean, in, in the end of the day, there's no reason why these shouldn't actually be within this exactly the same framework, even, even though you might not access those parts of it. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the analogies for what this could be are, but what, I, I, what strikes me all the time is it's, it's almost like the, in, the commons could be almost like the internet was a whole bunch of time ago, where it started with people, some people in this room would well remember probably, but you know, essentially a series of, of separate networks, so you could actually have separate domains that have their own commons effectively. But, you know, I think increasingly uh, it's just science is so interdisciplinary and so across that it, it makes sense to bring these kind of things together. And so with a, with a few simple rules, there's no reason why different communities can't exist in the same space. And if, if, it, if it makes sense to start looking at things in that other space, you should be able to do that. Um, you know, in a way that makes sense. So in other words, I mean, right now we, we effectively, in the internet space, we use, uh, you know, we use Google to find things, or being one <laughs> Google. Um, but, um, you know, you know if, if each domain develops this sort of an, an index for finding things in their domain, eventually the, the value in cross-purposing these things will, I'm sure, drive things into a common index. So, you know, I, at least that's how I would see it going forward. So I think, um, you know, but I think the initial steps are, you know, let's, let's get some, I'm already nervous about the fact, I'm talking about this a lot, and, it, and you know, this is not the first group I've talked to this about, and people are very compelled, but we need to, we need to do something. And I think that was, <laughs> that was that's, you know, and that's, you know, to, that's why I'm here, because you, you know, you're very keen to do things. And there are people, there are big doers in this room, Ed said so. I, I know a few of you, so it's, I know that to be true. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.